Welcome to the Bayesian Conspiracy. I'm Inyash Brodsky. I'm Steven Zuber. I'm Jay Sticky. And we got... Matt Freeman. Oh my god. Welcome back, Matt Freeman. A big friend of the podcast. And also... Gosh, you've been on at least twice before. You know, it's funny because I forgot about this, but I was on an episode a million years ago where we talked about rationalist community. No, okay. that was th- the main one I remember about you. Yeah, and it was like in the abstract, and I was like, it just seems like there should be some kind of formal <laughs> rationalist organization, damn it. Um, so it became the change you wanted to see in the world. I did, so I'm very happy about that. It feels very satisfying. Does that relate to what you're going to tell us today? It does relate to what I'm going to tell you about today. Should we talk about that now, or should we talk about these sequences first? We should always talk about the sequences <laughs> first, because that is part right. of our format. I'm pretending to be disappointed. Sequences are good. <laughs> <laughs> I like sequences. All right, so let us jump into the sequences as we always do. Um, the first sequence this week is natural selection speed limit and complexity bound and this is a very interesting post because it has um revisions what do you call it revisions uh, yeah like he he made mistakes the first time through and then i actually read the uh, uh comments on this one and there was like this back and forth between him and scott aronson hmm. the uh you know the, the math guy the math guy and not the Slate Star Codex guy. It, it, it's just <laughs> a very atypical uh, sequence post where it's just like, okay, I guess I don't know what to do with this. Yeah. I I like the fact that it's it's something that he put out there, turned out to be wrong, and then there's like a whole, this is the mistakes that were made, and here are you know what we found to actually be the case, and the original error is still out there and preserved so that people can see what it's like to you know be wrong and update and correct. Yeah. Sure would be nice if other news sites and article writers would do that yeah. i mean you can't expect everyone to not be evil <laughs> i guess not <laughs> so how fast is natural selection or isn't it <laughs> <laughs> who knows man um, <laughs> yeah like it, it was it, everything got hung up on this debate about like what is the definition of a bit because <laughs> Elazer was saying like evolution uh can only do one bit of, of selection per generation and then people were like that's nonsense and it's like well it depends are you talking about an infor- information theoretic bit or computer science bit and it's and then it just moved beyond my capacity to follow the argument frankly so the information theoretical bit is uh the amount of information needed to eliminate half the possibilities yes that's what he said in the post and i'll just have to take his word for it okay <laughs> sam i'm like if you say so right so i Gosh, I think I remember this going back to um, one of his posts about uh, presidential elections. But like at the very end, all the voters have their chance to give one bit of information selecting between the R and the D candidate. And to go from the population of the U.S. to one uh, to, to, you know, the one last bit needed at the end, you got to go through like something like 16, 18 bits uh, beforehand. (laughs) He's like. What the hell happened that the other 17 bits were taken out of the, the voters' choices? Why are they only deciding on the last one? Which was an interesting post, but not one that we're talking about today. So, <laughs> I, I but, will... Yeah, just but in both of those cases, I think I initially just thought that there was a sort of casual reference to bits. I didn't realize that they had formal definitions. I thought it was just like a piece of information, basically. Like the, the smallest chunk or... But yeah, no, apparently it... Uh, actually means something in the <laughs> example, several different things possibly well, like we, we have colloquialisms like tidbit or yeah. a little bit of this <laughs> exactly and... a skosh right well but i mean a things skosh. that use the word bit. one skosh of information <laughs> right can, can you pass me a bit of you know creamer for my coffee like mm-hmm. that's this is so when i think bit i think okay small piece a small amount right? yeah yeah see i always thought of bit as a one or as a program <laughs> and that actually makes it, it sort of falls in line with the information theoretic thing because with a one or a zero, there's two possibility made half of the ability. I guess, so it sort of yeah, makes sense to me. Actually, that's a really good mnemonic. That's probably also what that reference is. Well, and that's like huh. why you can play 20 questions with a not that sophisticated robot and mm-hmm. have it guess right because it's like, you know, is it um, a solid, you know, yes or no? And that eliminates like a huge possibility of space, right? And that's yeah. one bit of information. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, the example he gave in this post was uh, if parents had 16 children, and only two survived that's three bits of it as you have the number of children three times hmm yeah so, so the point the point of, of him even having this here right is to talk about optimization processes yes. because like the whole point of the sequences is to convince everyone that agi is a massive risk and to do that he convinces you that agi is going to be way more powerful than something you know really slow and stupid like evolution and so he's making fun of evolution being so slow based yes and the thing that he the, the, the thing that he talks about nature natural selection speed limit is the fact that um, natural selection works by 
killing off things with uh, that are less adapted, and the ad adaptations happen with through nat uh, random mutation. And when uh, a mutation happens, for most of them are uh, the vast amount are deleterious, and to get rid of deleterious genes in the population, things have to die off. I like to think of it as, uh, or like to simplify that to random mutations and non-random death. Yes, that's how evolution works. But since the uh, the mechanism of action is death, it means that out of every generation, you can only get rid of so many deleterious mutations without, you know, losing the entire gene pool. There's too many mutations to get rid of them all. You'd have to kill them. That's bad. Yeah. So that was a, the, the most subtle point that I don't think I even really grok is the idea that there's a maximum size to any genome, mm -hmm. which, which is determined by um, the mutation rate. Mm -hmm. and, and the argument being like, if the mutation rate is X then you need some amount of ongoing natural selection just to filter out the deleterious mutations. And th thus, that tells you the maximum size of the genome. Yes. And, and I was like, okay, I, I guess that makes sense. I'm not convinced that his argument actually proves it, and that's what a lot of the argument in the comments was about. But but sure, sure, whatever. Intuitively, that makes sense, though. If like, genes had a 1% error rate when, re when replicating, they couldn't be 4 billion pairs long. Right, because like everyone would just die of mutation. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If they had a one percent error rate, then one percent of the population would have to die every generation to keep the to keep the DNA sequence from deteriorating into completely. I wouldn't even say the species. I'd say like the individual cells, right? Like, <laughs> so I mean, I, I guess what I mean is that among just DNA replication, mm -hmm. which happens all the time in each individual organism. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, that that would if if an error rate of one percent would just wreck that that uh, organism pretty quickly i mean it does over the course of a few decades but i mean pretty quickly yeah yeah the the the, the right yeah. i think yeah. the yeah the mutation doesn't keep happening uh, and it, it's, or some of them i mean like a lot of mutations sort of happen uh and impair like the development of the creature but then it like doesn't keep mutating and the rate is also really important like as you said a one percent error rate would murder things and uh according to what it says here in the post that among mammals the rate of DNA copying errors is roughly 1 in 10 to the negative 8th per base pair per generation, which is uh, 1 in 100 million, though much lower than 1%. Yeah, but basically nothing on average because most of your DNA sequence doesn't do anything. It, yeah. it, there's some, there's, I forget the number, but there's some like number of mutations that the average person has, and I feel Mostly, like it's in the uh, tens or something. In like yeah. the copied genes, though. Although there are some species that have less junk DNA than so. That's also kind of interesting, but probably, I don't know, overly complicated since we already are confusing ourselves with this. <laughs> but the interesting thing that he points out is that if we assume a, um, a error correction rate of one bit per generation, which is actually, I guess, when it comes down to it later on, the thing that this hinged on that is most, um, most in question, which is why, why the, why what he proposed was wrong. But if you assume one bit of selection pressure per generation, uh, that means that in a, a species that has an error rate of one per hundred million, that means you are at most going to have a hundred million meaningful base pairs that encode something because you can correct one per, uh, per hundred million per generation, uh, which is basically what he comes down to. He near at the end, he says the genome genome project gave final confirmation when it announced that humans probably only had 20 to 25,000 protein coding genes. 25,000 genes plus regulatory regions will fit within 100 million base pairs with lots of room to spend. So yeah, that that is the, the primary half of the thrust of the original article. There was one thing about this article that bothered me, actually, was that he kept using the word complexity. Mm -hmm. Number one, I thought that that was a word that he warned us not to use. <laughs> but that, did he agree on this before this, or was that something he wrote after, though? I, I don't know. I, I should have looked that up. Because maybe he was beating himself up about it. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe. But the, like, I, I was specifically... Even if he hadn't already warned us about this, I was like, what do you mean by complexity? Like, he says sentences in there, like, or maybe it's in the comments, he says stuff like, uh, you know, a giraffe probably isn't more complicated, uh, more complex than a stegosaurus. And I'm like, what do you mean by complex? I think what he <laughs> means is that requires more than 100 billion base pairs to encode so you everything meaningful. You think he just means that maybe stegosaurus had a bigger genome than giraffe? Uh, either that or, you know, was used the same amount of information, just uh, encoded different things. Because yeah, the one of the <laughs> the major, I think what the major point was by the time you get to the end of this is that since you can only, uh, since you can only correct one out of every hundred million, that means you have an per generation, that means you have an effective upper limit of 100 million coding base pairs, which means that once you're using all of those, 
you can't get like even more complex. You can't get even more information uh, shoved into a gene code. Uh, what you end up doing is reducing one type of complexity, reducing the information needed to encode one thing in order to increase the complexity of something else. Like some parts of your genome are going to get simpler and not as not as needing as many base pairs to encode what they do in order to make other things more complicated. Good answer. Yeah. Uh, that's how though. Is... Complexity is a loaded word. And Inyash and I argued about it a couple episodes ago on the Not Everything is a Clue, a clue podcast. <laughs> yeah. I think that's one of those words that yeah, Eliezer or other rationalists have sort of just tried to ban. Well, I'm trying to remember the other one too. It was, uh, oh, emergent. Yeah. That's another word that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> so, like, how how is AI going to become sentient? Oh, you know, sentience is an emergent trait. That's not an answer. Yeah. He The bolded thing that I pulled out of this one was, uh, the direct quote that I bolded and pulled out was, natural selection probably hit its complexity bound no more than 100 million generations after multicellular organisms got started. Since then, over the last 600 million years, evolutions have substituted new complexity for lost complexity rather than accumulating adaptations. Which, maybe... Yeah. <laughs> and in conclusion, haha, evolution's dumb. <laughs> well, in conclusion, we have the thing at the very end that happened where there was, uh, he, he made the argument that basically you could, uh, due to this upper limit on complexity, um, code a everything meaningful about a human genome in 25 megabits, uh, due to how bits and information bits and computer bits are, you know, similar enough that you can, you can, there, there was an argument. And then didn't that turn out to not be the case? That turned out to not be the case uh, when they someone tried to create a computer program to actually model this, to simulate it. Uh, they ran into a thing where it didn't reach that limit. It kept going up like at a um, increasing... like it, it was an exponential taper, right? Rather than hitting that limit. And uh, there was a lot of talk about this. And when you go to the wiki, the summary at the bottom of the wiki is... Ahem. Uh... The first part being the idea of an upper bound on the sustainable information in a genome uh, and that mammals are already at this upper bound has been and has been for tens of millions of years, if not longer, is not original to Yudkowsky. It's an example from George Williams' adaptations and natural selections. Um, Plagiarism. Yes. Uh, the Probably not. The computer simulation failed to bear out the bound and the flaw... Well, I, he specifically credited George. Oh, then never mind. <laughs> George Williams, yeah, in the post. Uh, but the the flaw appears to have been as follows. Even if one mutation creates one death, which is where the whole you can only do one bit of information per generation comes from, this does not mean that one death eliminates only a single mutation. Organisms bearing more deleterious mutations are more likely to lose the evolutionary competition, and so each death can eliminate more mutations than average. If mating is random, then... Uh, Which is not, but Yeah, then anyway. information supportable in the genome goes as the inverse square of the mutation rate, uh, which basically ups the, the bound on how complex something can be if you can uh, have more than one bit of selection correction in a generation. Cool. Yeah. Therefore, evolution's not dumb and bad. Just well, kidding, it still is. <laughs> it is both still dumb and bad, but the upper bound might not be quite as low as was uh, theorized in this post. Uh, at the very end of the wiki, it says, uh, it, it basically summarizes all the various inputs that went into this, including uh, Fisher's limit to how much selection a population could sustain, uh, Kimura's mutation rates, um, and again, Wallace's original upper bound argument. Uh, it ends with, if we assume that only Yudkowsky's attempt at a novel contribution actually failed, and that we should go on trusting the other authors, then on the whole, it is still safe to say that evolutionary biologists think there are speed limits and complexity bounds, just not that the complexity bound is 25 megabits as calculated the way Yudkowsky tried to calculate it. So, upper yep. bound. Got to trade some complexity for other complexity, but it's not quite at the place where Yudkowsky was trying to say. It was a cool idea, though. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I actually appreciate that it's still preserved, so you could see the thought process and the retraction or revision or whatever, right. whatever they called it. Yeah, I like the fact that he tried to put like a solid number on it, even if it didn't bear out. You know, just having the 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 vague idea that there is an upper bound that is traded against is less like having. A, it's too bad we yeah. don't have that number. Do we not have a number? Is it incalculable or has anyone calculated it yet? I think it varies by enough things like how many people die, how many beneficial or deleterious mutations are. Like it's just too chaotic? Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's neat. But I'm also not an evolutionary biologist, so I could be wrong about this. That is just my understanding from reading these posts and doing a little bit of wiki work. And we didn't define deleterious. We mean just bad uh, mutations. Things that make it less likely that you will have offspring. Yes. Yeah, like there's benign mutations. Uh, I don't know, like... A deer's born with three horns instead of two or something, which, like, maybe would just be fine. 
but not really convey any advantage or disadvantage. So deleterious would be if it was like born with a horn growing out of its brain. Right. <laughs> it's a particularly bad one. But yeah, I was maybe those weren't the best examples. That's what my brain went to. I don't have the best brain here. Either. Maybe like a different shade of brown versus having right. no hair at all. You know, or yeah. no fur. But I just wanted to raise the point that like deleterious mutations are going to be way more likely just because there's a lot more ways to fuck things up than there are to make things better. Yeah. Which is why that's that's what they say the um the, the why there is an upper limit because most things are bad and mostly selection is working to keep things. I feel like I drove way too much and doing a lot of talking. Does then someone else want to drive more for the next less wrong post? Well, we need to apparently be aware of Stephen Jay Gould. Why do we need to be aware? <laughs> be aware. Beware. Not be aware. I guess you can be. You have to be aware of him before you can be aware of him. Actually, but... yeah. What the word means, or I think beware is more connotations of danger. Be anyway, <laughs> be wary. I would say. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> this is what happens when I try to drive. <laughs> uh, foolish evolutionary biologists say Gould believe that evolution has a preferred tendency towards progress and the accumulation of complexity. But of course, Gould kindly explains this is simply a statistical illusion. What is the problem with Gould saying this? Um, there was a time when many evolutionary biologists had a romantic conception of progress. Evolution climbed ever higher. Uh, they, they were climbing these ever higher mountains of complexity, dinosaur to dog to man. Or like, sort of brings to mind that t-shirt that I hate of the like march of evolution that shows an ape like turning into a human and standing proudly as though, like, this were the pinnacle. Right. <laughs> I had a friend once talk to me, we were talking about Star Trek, and I was mentioning, you know, because we are talking about real aliens in space and how they would look nothing like, you know, basically humans with makeup. And he's like, well, isn't this, like, the, the optimal form put forward <laughs> by... And I'm like, not no, not precisely... Both. Yeah, not... I, I don't want to, like, get into, like, too much of it with him, but I'm like, that's just not how... It, no, that's not how it works. That's how it happened here, yeah. right? There's no reason to think it would be anything like that on another planet, especially one that's, like, way different. I can name so many reasons why humans are, like, poorly designed, actually. Let's start with the spine! Oh my god, yes. <laughs> Fuck spines. Uh, but anyway, so there was a hero who challenged this widespread misconception. George Williams. Uh, not Stephen Jay Gould. Not Stephen Jay Gould. Yes. Uh, His challenge was successful and... Saying the things he did didn't make him a heroic, persecuted martyr. He simply won. His arguments were accepted, and biology moved on. In fact, the shift to a gene's eye view of, of in evolutionary theory is sometimes called the Williams Revolution. Is it? Huh. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I'm, I don't know evolution, a lot of evolutionary biologists. Yeah, I, I don't know very many, so I'm again taking this from uh, from from the post. It's sometimes, at least once, called the Williams Evolution here in this post. <laughs> <laughs> in this post, <laughs> I don't know when Williams did his. Th- Thing, but 66. I know that. Okay, yeah. So Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, was in 1975, and I think that popularized this view anyway. At least among the public, you know, it wasn't a scientific paper. I remember it was a, a lot of people book. still arguing about it at the time. Uh, the Selfish Gene Theory, I mean. Um, I don't know if that's relevant, but I just remember finding it really funny that part of it was like a scientific argument, and then part of it was that non scientists thought that he was trying to say that because genes are selfish that means that like humans are inherently selfish and that like <laughs> selfishness is good <laughs> yeah right uh, when in fact ken selection is totally compatible with the genes eye view which it, 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 it's an, this is another weird post right because it's it's Eliezer at his more polemical and firebrandy and he's 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 not just like here's he's, he's like he's like fuck this gould guy basically mm-hmm. in fact this is another one where you read in the comments and some people are like i think you're being a little hard on him he's like no actually fuck him um it's you know <laughs> or beware it's of him anyway yeah. Yeah. i i just had a dust up with a friend i don't know if you want to call it a dust up sometimes you can get dusty and still have fun but like a dust up with a <laughs> with a friend in a in a discord server about a very similar kind of thing where someone was trying to do the same sort of thing gould is doing i'm like fuck that person and all their <laughs> bullshit it's like but but what he's saying is correct i'm like yeah it's correct but fuck him for trying to imply that everybody else thinks the wrong thing yeah <laughs> so i mean nobody knows what we're talking about yet because we haven't gotten to the the meat of this post <laughs> if gould had simply stolen william's ideas and presented them as his own then he would have been guilty of plagiarism and yet at least the general public would have been accurately informed in that sense less damage would have been done to the public understanding of science but gould's conduct was much stranger he wrote as if the entire Williams Revolution had never occurred. Gould attacked as if they were still current views, romantic notions that no serious biologist had put forth since the 1960s. Gould undid the last 30 years of progress in his depiction of the field, 
uh, that he was criticizing, pretending that evolutionary theory was in chaos, so he could depict himself as heroically bringing order to it. This reminds me of every time the like science publications or um, science news, I guess, sites are still like, "Was Einstein wrong?" <laughs> I'm just like, "No, <laughs> <laughs> like stop." <laughs> and then sure enough you read the article and it was like nope <laughs> we thought maybe he was for a few seconds there but nope <laughs> isn't that just a rule of, of the web if you read a news headline with a question the answer is always no is that yeah actually Basically. i'm trying to think of counter examples and having a hard time <laughs> uh, can bees think <laughs> gold systemically misrepresented what other scientists thought he deluded the public as to what evolutionary biologists were thinking. <laughs> yes. Steven. And therefore, watch out for him. He's like creeping around in dark alleys. And <laughs> You remember being part of the atheist. Yeah. Actually, we're all Good of us times. here part yeah. of the atheist. Oh, yeah. Wars? Okay, yeah. Uh, but it, it would be almost like if someone came around and saying that like, also, like, how could morality possibly work? Atheists were always saying that there is, uh, without God, everything is permitted. Uh, but I have this theory about how actually it makes life better for everyone on Earth if we follow morality, and therefore I am a genius. Are you just trying to, like, intuition pump why you would be angry about this? Yeah, because okay. if you've been going on for 30 years not thinking that everything is permitted, and you know that everyone else in atheism doesn't think that, we don't go around raping and murdering, and someone comes around who's like, I am an atheist and I have found the answer. They're like, no, fuck you. Why are you trying to tell everybody that the rest of us are immoral monsters who are just now hearing about why not to rape and murder? What's fun is that's usually done like as just straw manning other people's positions that you don't like. Mm -hmm. You'll give some terrible interpretation of it and yeah. act like it's this, you know, Evolutionists this bad think idea. That, like, yeah. Life just appeared. Yeah, your grandpa was a monkey. But like, that's usually where they stop. And then if you're just going to, you know, straw man somebody, but they're trying like, but no, here I am with the solution. Yes. And it's like, but. But we are we've all been aware of the solution. Yeah. It's like if someone tried to pretend like their their new essay on why you shouldn't torture animals was like groundbreaking. Right. And it's like, but this this is not a new thought. You don't get to get credit for thinking <laughs> like ahead of the curve here. It's not that it's not <laughs> just that you don't get to get credit. It's the fact that you are making everyone else think that we all think it's okay to torture animals. Yeah. You come in and you're like, Well, as we all know, it's okay to torture animals, right? But aha, uh -huh, look at my new <laughs> thesis. Yeah. Just like what? Nobody was Go away. <laughs> and it's specifically when you're a beleaguered minority that has lots of lies told about it anyway, that is what's particularly... Like, okay. if you were an evolutionary biologist at the time of atheism, and someone goes around saying this kind of shit, you'd be like, fuck you. Okay, now I, I imagine, get right? yeah. why you brought up atheism more is because evolutionary biology was pretty... I guess continues to be, like, kind of a hard field to be in, because there's so much idiocy about it. Well, so yeah. Um, Does anyone think are that reading he was next too time? harsh on Google? In this? Well, so, so so one thing which um, I don't know if it even necessarily came across in the post is like Gould was like a famous popularizer. Like he yeah. made, he wrote a lot of like well regarded books. So this would this would be like I don't know if if Neil deGrasse Tyson or someone was just constantly full of shit about astronomy or something. <laughs> you're, 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 it's it's like it's way more offensive because he's so successful yeah. at at being a you know he's the guy right. Like yeah. because you know people will read this book yeah. and who like don't know. Right. The, the you know, if they're not an evolutionary biologist or haven't followed the field, they'd be like, "Oh, he is a hero! Wow, I can't believe everybody thought this other dumb thing." And yeah. It's just like, no. Right. <laughs> I, I remember being like having my back my back put up by this post actually because I had read a book by Stephen Jay Gould before I read the sequences, and I was like, <gasps> "That bastard!" He's you know, just attacking <laughs> my right. my friend Stephen Jay Gould, which you know, it's funny. I don't really remember the Gould book, so it must not have been very good. But. <laughs> Whoops. But yeah, you said Selfish Gene came out in 75. Selfish Gene was 76. So Gould's running around saying that like he's the first person to talk about the gene-centric view of evolution in the like the 90s. More importantly, that everyone else still believed the opposite. And that's, that's weird. Yeah. That it just like that's that's the kind of stuff you could get away with, you know, a century earlier maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's and it's also like he had to have known, right? Cuz I yeah. did catch myself like, huh, maybe he just like assumed that that was the view. And wasn't just being self-aggrandizing, but no, I don't think so. He probably... In the post, Eliezer quotes several sources. Like, we have tried to talk to him specifically. <laughs> <laughs> He's locked himself in his room. He's like, I, no, I'm not taking any interviews. Yeah. Especially not if it's about that book. Yeah, I mean, I, like, unfortunately, e even just my sort of normal amount of exposure to academia in, in getting a PhD has exposed me to so many professors and just academics in general who are just so obsessed with credit and mm. recognition 
and like they like I some like you you know that they're just going to exaggerate how much of a role they had in whatever the thing is and you can totally buy that there's just like a type of person who would pretend that they invented evolution you know yeah. because Isn't that the entire character of professor slughorn in harry potter i think so yes he that was is the, like, yeah, yeah, teacher yeah. that they had to manipulate to get him back to tell like everybody what he knew about voldemort by being like we've got these students who are really great and then you could take credit for them being really great by being their teacher and mm-hmm. he's just like no, I must not say anything about the Dark Lord. I'm scared of it. Wait, what credit? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Matt, have you ever been in a conversation with a non-rationalist who, when they learn about, you know, the rationalist idea, is like, oh, so you guys are a bunch of robots that, that don't believe emotions are important and you can just think your way out of anything? Of course, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. a- and then if I were to come up and say, yes, that is what all of them believe, especially Matt here, but I have this new idea about how emotions are actually very important heuristics that get us through the day. Yeah, and, and in fact, you might even need to have some kind of training regimen or organization in order to make it so that you could become more rational effectively. <laughs> oh my god, it was a good segue. That was a fantastic segue, so we should segue right after we tell the people what our next posts will be. I suppose. Uh, for next week, we will be reading and talking about The Tragedy of Group Selectionism. Ooh. Is this the one that's the inspiration for the bugs from Three Worlds Collide? Oh, is it? Maybe. Sounds sounds related. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. And also fake selfishness. So that's for next time. But Matt, you were talking to us about... Okay, so w- last time we had you on, just just well, not... as a quick refresher. I don't know about last time. Maybe maybe the first time you had me on. I don't really remember. But Last time was GPT-3. Last time was GPT-3. Oh, shit. You're right. God, yeah. you're on for I a lot of I think I've things. been on like four, actually. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Um, but so, so a while ago, you know, I, I and I think all of us had this feeling like there should be some kind of, of way for us to practice our skills and get better because like, you know, step zero is you find the sequences, you find the rationalist literature online, you read it, and you're like, this is awesome. This is going to change my life. And then it never changes your life as much as you kind of feel like it should. Mm-hmm. And then step one is you find some people either in real life or online who you can talk about the material with and then you and then you actually begin to kind of sharpen your skills i think and that kind of forms a virtuous cycle with you practicing the skills in real life and then maybe discussing them and discussing your experiences with people and i think that's the function that the denver rationalist community has served for for all of us but also that i think that tops out at a certain point because we're not really practicing aggressively it would be just like if we're a bunch of friends who enjoy martial arts and talk about martial arts all the time but we don't go train martial arts right yeah right. a lot of our meetups we do kind of just hang out and talk about our dogs and what yeah. tv shows we watched and then like sometimes rationalist stuff too but not in any kind of structured way right and so a while back y'all had two members of the organization that 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 i'm starting with with them um, which at the time was called the guild of servants now it's called the guild of the rose which is basically just meant to be sort of an online uh, um, organization for um, number one learning rationalist skills and number two forming a, a, a community structure in which you can collaboratively practice these skills those that was alex and david Yusuf, right that we had I, on i believe it was alex and david Yusuf. yes okay. i remember that i was we'll link put a link to that that episode in our notes i was quite excited about it and uh i believe were you part of that initial? Yeah, it was okay. It was in the beginning of the plague year. Were you in the first cohort? I was not. Uh, Phoenix was, and I watched them do most of their Zoom calls or their whatever Zoom analog calls. Okay. Uh, so I got to see some of the process, but I wasn't in the alpha. So two and a half of the conspirators were in the alpha, and... Uh... And you have come here to tell us, like, how things are going, what has been learned, how things are evolving, what's up with the whole guild project. Yeah, so um, I'm not going to bury the lead. I'll just mention that we're starting up the beta uh, September 1st. Um, So if you were in the alpha, you are essentially already welcome to come back for the beta. Um, And if you weren't in the alpha, then just show up. Uh, So go to guildoftherose.org, first of all, and you can easily find all the relevant links and stuff. And, you know, if you're at all interested, just check that out and then you you can join the Discord. And um, basically what's going on right now is we, we, sorry, go ahead. Real quick, we're also going to put links to that in the show notes and at the uh, website, thebasingconspiracy.com. And it's Guild of the Rose, Guild spelled of, just like it sounds. Guildoftherose.org, yep. Next. Oh, dot org. Dot org. Oh, you don't you have to jump org. through extra hoops to get that? I, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't part of the website process, actually. Okay, cool. Um, Congrats, that's pretty cool. So you personally did not have to, yeah, <laughs> but I, somebody I, I else did. probably did. Yeah, which interestingly is is a perfect segue to what I was going to say, which is like we, we actually learned a lot from from the alpha. Uh, 
we learned that, you know, j- just basically being, you know, a core of, of six or so uh, people who wanted to make this thing happen and would would do our best to talk through and solve problems collaborative, collaboratively wasn't really the best solution. And so we, we now have, you know, a leadership structure and an organizational structure. And we actually, you know, the, the guild is now actually a, a, you know, a corporate entity, actually. Mm-hmm. We founded it as a, a B Corp, which is um, a sort of special business structure where uh, instead of being beholden entirely to like the profit motive, uh, you, you can write bylaws whereby you're beholden to other uh, criteria. This is sort of an attempt to avoid good harding. And also we're sort of trying to bake in uh, uh, a mentality toward avoiding, um, you know, optimization toward criteria that we don't approve of early in the process. Real quick, good harding is one of the things you'll probably learn if you join the Guild of the Rose. <laughs> but what is good harding for the people who are not yet uh, privileged guild members? Sure, that's just that's one of these pieces of rationalist language where it basically just means like um, optimizing for some uh, criteria that that you would never have chosen, but you know. An example, like we're talking about, would be how corporations begin optimizing for profit, and then they begin basically destroying a lot of value as a side effect, uh, and doing things that, that no one in the organization would even approve of, but it, the organization has set their target as maximizing profit. My favorite example of Good Harding comes from The Wire, where uh, the police want to reduce the homicide rate, and it's pretty important to get the homicide rate down for this quarter specifically because the mayor is running for re-election. And one of the ways to get the homicide rate down, in addition to additional policing, is finding a body and just not reporting it as a homicide <laughs> for a while. <laughs> because, or even at all, specific, uh, possibly, because, you know, you're not optimizing for less people murdered. You're optimizing for the rate that's turned in on the report being lower. Mm-hmm. So, well, you yeah. know, he could have tripped and fallen on that knife eight times. We don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah more investigation is needed exactly um but yeah so i mean like there's all sorts of directions we, we could go with this conversation i think one one thing i wanted to say kind of up front is is like uh we we think that there needs to be something that's like cfar but you know for everyone so like cfar is like uh thirty nine hundred dollars per per you know uh, intensive week of, of training. And I was always, you know, I'm never going to go to a CFAR camp because I'm not going to leave my kids for like a, a week so I can go get rationalist training. Isn't it too? I, I'm not on even, oh, yeah, okay. it's, it's even, it's even worse, right? <laughs> um, you and, could backdoor and, it like I did. Yeah. I, I, did you? I, I don't know. The uh, story. I, Phoenix went to CFAR, so oh, okay. I get to go to the CFAR reunions with them because they let you do a plus one. Very clever. But uh, yeah. I also can't afford that. <laughs> so the guild currently has the payment model where we ask for fifteen dollars a month, but uh, if you just send us an email asking for admittance and and you know say that hey you know money's tight, then we'll admit you regardless because we don't want to we don't want to screen anyone out for monetary reasons. Um, and, and we want to give every you know I, I think the current policy is is you get a, a free two months when you start um, so that you can you know see that it's actually valuable to you. Um, that actually reminds me before we move on that CFAR also has a discount rate or maybe just uh, like scholarships available for people. Uh, so if somebody does want to go to CFAR and can't afford it uh, and isn't lazy like me, they could <laughs> probably apply for that too. <laughs> but um, so, Guild of the Rose though. Yeah. What? Uh, so right now you're taking applicants for the the beta that's going to run mm-hmm. uh what would someone get out of the beta if they were to so the beta uh currently we have four courses slated and the way the courses work is uh, basically uh you know between say three and five weeks of uh weekly sessions per course so i'm going to be teaching the first course actually which is on um practical decision theory um so just to give you the brief blurb on that as as an example uh so I have some some grounding in you know the academic decision theory, and I've been using the tools of academic decision theory to kind of help me make life choices throughout my life. And so I had the idea for the course is like, okay, I want to teach everybody uh, the fundamentals of decision theory and probability trees, and and you know Bayesian updating, kind of the the bag of tools that constitute academic decision theory. But then I also want to talk about how I have applied that to my life over the years. And so this is I think this is a good example of what we kind of see as being the guild course where. Some member of the community thinks that they have something to contribute that could be useful to other rationalists that, that could you know maybe become a new kind of core rationalist um, um, piece of, of dogma or technique or whatever and then and then we all learn it together and you know then may, maybe 
get feedback on that, right? Like I expect to get feedback on that. And so there's actually, you know, once you've gone through the process, we actually invite people to come to us with ideas for future courses because uh, surely everybody, you know, everybody has their splinter skills and their special interests and their professional talents that they could probably take something out of and contribute back to the community. So how does one of these courses work? I mean, assuming there's no like um, classroom that you meet at due to the whole dispersed thing. Yes. So what it is, there are two uh, weekly sessions. Uh, um, uh, you only have to attend one of them and the times are, are basically set so that uh, if you if you live in the Western Hemisphere, it'll probably make more sense for you to attend one of them. And if you live in the Eastern Hemisphere, it'll probably make more sense for you to attend the other. Uh, and and we, if you live overseas, do your best. Yeah. Or, the Eastern Hemisphere. Yeah. Oh, wait, you're talking about the world. Yeah, the, the, yeah. Whole, the, the whole world, right? Yeah. No, I feel silly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so so basically, um, the we're using what is known as the flipped classroom model, which basically means... Uh, we will post, you know, a bit of reading material, maybe some YouTube videos to watch, um, maybe, maybe a, a little bit of homework, and, and you are intended to do that on your own time. And then when you come to the course session, you're not listening to somebody talk for an hour. You are almost immediately going to be put into a discussion group to talk about the material in, a, in sort of a guided discussion with, you know, one person in that group being tapped as the, as the discussion leader. Um, so really the the course itself is that someone put in the time to kind of curate or maybe even create some learning material for you and then and then you discuss it with other rationalists or discuss you know the the homework or you know sh show your homework product to the others and um, you know I, I think the we all think and I think the sort of best practices of, of how these things work these days is that I think the flipped classroom model is just a better way of doing things when you have the internet and you have the, the capability to do things asynchronously um, rather than just kind of force everybody to listen to somebody talk for an hour when you can record things now. I'm really curious to try that out. Uh, I wish that like, for example, programming boot camps, well, some of them probably do that uh, style, but... Are you thinking of applying for the beta? Yeah, I already did. Oh, cool. Congratulations. Have you been accepted? <laughs> uh... No, I think I need to get on the Discord and poke somebody, apparently. But yeah. but I'm excited about it. Yeah, l let me just address that. Um, we did shift, actually, in the last couple of weeks toward just saying that we would rather have more people in the beta than be selective. And so we're just accepting everyone now. So um, just basically just show up. Oh, just show up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And people have until September 1st? Oh, they can join even after that, actually. It's just the first course session happens on September 1st, which is actually just going to be a, I believe, just kind of a meet and greet okay. rather than specifically a uh, hard-hitting uh, piece of uh, learning. But um, So for anyone who's listening to this, when it comes out, you have a full week to still get in from the very ground floor. But even if, uh, if you have missed that, there's still plenty of opportunity to get in there. So uh, are you going to do cohorts again? Yes. Um, so the cohorts were one thing that, that I think, uh, from, from what I've heard from people, was successful. And the idea there was basically a giant Discord full of people is usually just a terrible thing and should never be allowed to happen. <laughs> um, and so what we do is, is you will be assigned a cohort, which is like basically six, uh, like, like five to seven people um, uh, who are, you know, that's, that's basically your team. That's the team you're going to be put in with during the course sessions for discussions. That's the team where if we assign any group work, you're going to be assigned to do the group work with those people. Um, at some point, we're going to introduce a concept of sort of inter-cohort inter competitions, <laughs> which, which could be fun, I think. Um, and, uh, and, and so the, the idea there is, you know, People, people actually work best when they have kind of a, a task force size group of, of human beings, like a, uh, you know, a rating group, if you will. A rating um, party. <laughs> yeah, a rating party, right. Um, so I actually wanted to, to ask you guys about this because I, you know, I was sort of in a, in a behind the scenes administrative position for the alpha. You, you guys were actually in the alpha and or, and or saw someone being in the alpha. So I wanted to ask how the cohort experience was from the other side. Uh, the cohort specifically, I really liked. Mm -hmm. That was uh, probably my favorite part of the the whole um, Guild of Serpents, I guess. I, I keep wanting to say no, Guild of the Rose. Yeah. Okay. Well, now it's the Guild of the Rose. Yeah. Now it's the Guild. Okay. Yeah. The that I think that was my favorite part because like you got to I don't know I'm a social creature and I got to like actually meet people and form some connections and everyone in my cohort was really cool. I I you know wouldn't mind like meeting up with them again, but it's kind of, sort of not. I don't know. You know how it is. School ends, you fragment, you drift your own 
ways you don't you don't see them anymore but yeah that was good times cool. i like the cohort a lot similar sentiment i mean it was uh we've got a couple channels in the beijing conspiracy discord like information requests and um i don't i guess there's not like a general like can i have help with this sort of thing that's kind of an information request but it was like that rather than just like scream into the void and hope hopefully you know someone answers you could just ping a group and be like hey i'm, I'm trying to figure this out what do you guys think and you 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 could get immediate feedback it's just, just you know small teams are more uh well small dedicated teams are more efficient at getting that sort of thing done than just a large mass of people yeah, yeah i wasn't in it but uh just my impression was that because there were fewer people not like you said just a big discord full of people screaming everybody got more of a chance to talk if they wanted to to like sort of get to know each other and that made it more comfortable for people to come forward with questions or to share what they'd uh been doing it for the homework um and also just like when you're doing a video chat that's like how many faces you can fit on the screen at a time mm -hmm. and that's just something that annoys me every time there's like a large discord zoom video chat thing where there's like 30 people and you can see 10 of them yeah and some of them you just never even see their face if they never get the chance to talk because they're too shy or just they don't get a word in edgewise so i think that was probably really useful to just like have people be able to see each other and remember each other's faces and yeah learn some you know learn some about each other and then sort of feel like they have this like like sort of hitting us just like, like a high school or a college friendship uh could have like reunions <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, this, this this makes me happy to hear because I think it just suggests that the the core idea is a good one. Where you know, like I said at the at the top, half of the goal is to have like courses and actual material where we're actually practicing, you know, the punches and kicks of of the metaphorical martial art. But then the other half is like you know, actual meaningful community, not just you know, you have a you yeah. Know. And it seems like it lets you. I guess like the number of instructors would be the limiting factor, but you were saying like you're just accepting everybody. Uh, where size might have been an issue before, like it might have had to have been more selective. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, yeah, like again, instructors are still, I don't know if they're calling them instructors, but like presenters, uh, do they have a name by the way? Uh, I, I think instructor or, or, or teacher is, is valid. Sensei. Yeah, mm. we, should, we should do that actually. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you mentioned about the actual punches and kicks of rationality. Uh, I w when you said your class is going to be specifically about, um, thinking in terms of decision theory and probability distributions and such uh how i guess how advanced is that like what how much would you get out of it if you're already pretty familiar with those things um if i don't know you've been reading the sequences forever and you keep up with slate star codex and like how how much how deep is it well yeah so and, and that's a that's a very interesting question because i think I think the the only kind of fair way to answer is that I think that every every instructor will every instructor will have a different sort of sense of what they're trying to do with their course, and so you may have some people who come expecting a lot of technical sophistication, and some who um, some who are maybe addressing things that you would consider basic. Um, I am I am aiming to address the sorts of things that I honestly think are uh, done wrong a lot when I see discussions of these things in the community. Um, now, there will be some some going over the, the basics, you know, and there are some things that that maybe you would think of as basic. Okay, I'm going to speak for myself here. There are certain things where I'm like, of course I know how to make a, uh, a decision tree. Like, I, I learned how to do it in school. I've done it many times in my life, both for work and for my personal life. And then I sit down and I try to make a decision tree for some new situation. And then I'm like, hold on a second, wait a second. What order do I need to do these two things in? Because this is a new situation. And then you realize like, oh, just because you abstractly kind of understand how to do a thing doesn't mean that you actually know how to do it actually. And this is, the, I mean, this is why I keep going to the, to the martial arts metaphor is like, Martial arts, you know, online discussion arguments are full of like, yes, well, my spin hook kick would, would counter your your block. And it's like, no, you have to try these things, right? You have to, tr like, until you've done like 100 decision trees, can you really say that you know how to do a decision tree, mm -hmm. right? Um, how so did that, you force someone to do a decision tree without like having an actual, you know, hard real life decision that you're giving them? It doesn't have to be a hard decision, right? Like, if they don't know what they want to eat for breakfast, you could still do it. 
Yeah. Uh, so, so I mean, one, I mean, just just as an example, one of the you know assignments that I'm going to be giving in the course is is basically um, think of some decision in your life that you're facing and and make a decision tree for that, and then bring that to the to your cohort session to discuss. And it it can literally be. Um, what you know? Are you going to go out for breakfast? Or are you going to cook eggs? Yeah, it or... might actually be easier to practice with something that's not like you know, what college should I go to, or should I quit my job because the stakes are lower, and then you sort of have the muscle memory of how to do a decision tree when you need it. Just like how you don't want your first fight after martial arts <laughs> training to be a fight for your life, you'd rather have it be a gentle sparring session. It, yeah. Yeah. But like, yeah, I, I really like the metaphor of rationalist techniques. As I don't know, I've heard people calling um their thing rationalist dojos and the metaphor of a martial art because that is sort of the point of you know practicing your punches and kicks in a low stake situation so that you don't have to think about it when somebody pulls a knife on you right yeah and because you know i actually think that the tools of decision theory specifically are at their most useful when the stakes are high because fundamentally in my opinion the tools of decision theory are about breaking down a problem into the, the most fundamental elements, which for me, when I'm facing a difficult life decision and I'm trying to balance like, like in like money versus where I'm going to like, imagine like you're deciding if you want to change jobs or something mm-hmm. like this is actually a very emotional decision. It's it, you, you lose sleep over a, yeah. a decision like this. Right. And then that makes your decision making worse if you don't have these tools. Yeah. Cause then you're just stressing out about it. And then you're like, I don't want to think about it. It's got a big ug field around it. Exactly. I found a lot of my hardest decisions aren't, aren't those because they don't i don't know they don't feel like they matter that much it's like well if i don't get this job i'll get another job whatever i'm not going to starve but my, my hardest decisions are social decisions we're like i'm in a i don't know car ride with some people and some some topic comes up and someone who expresses a very strong emotional opinion i'm like <laughs> i want to say well actually and and bust out like you know the the there has been research on this matter but i'm like but i really like this person and they're very emotional right now, and I don't want to say that, but then I feel like I've not been a good, I don't want to say good rationalist, but like I have not been doing my punching and my kicking because I'm just allowing this sort of thing to go by. And I know there's ways to say it where like it would be kind and thoughtful and helpful and supportive, and I don't want to be like, you know, well, actually, guy, you're totally wrong. Here's the science. I, I you know, yeah. I want to, that's that's the, the kind of thing that I would the decisions that I fail at where I end up just staying silent instead. So what you're saying is that you're volunteering to teach a course on nonviolent communication for the guild. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to teach that course actually. I'm uh, particularly interested in that kind of thing as like a kid that sort of, you know, grew up probably autistic and really anxious and didn't learn social skills until like my teens and twenties. Uh, so I feel like I actually got more per- perspective on what it's like to sort of try to build social skills from first principles n- without having the normal instincts that neurotypical people have there that guide that. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think that would be awesome. I think, you know, some, uh, if, if you did actually want to teach that course, that would be great. Or may- maybe, you know, nonviolent communication, uh, street epistemology is another thing that I think would be an awesome thing to do oh, a, yeah. a short course on. It's yeah. also really complimentary. Yeah. because like Alex practice that? I think... I think he uh, is involved in that community in, in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. And he has not yet taught a course on that in the guild? <laughs> I mean, Calling you out, Alex. Well, we get, it, we'll, we'll get around to it. I, I, I mean, that's the thing is, if, if somebody's really passionate about it and or knowledgeable about that kind of thing, then um, then we would love to, to have a, a course on it. Um, and the thing is, like, a, a you know, three-week course on a thing is never going to be the equivalent of, you know, doing a deep dive into that community and spending months on it. But the, the purpose of the course is more to... Um, to introduce people who may not be familiar with those ideas and then teach them maybe a handful of, of basic skills that, that could then be practiced in an ongoing way. Um, or at least direct them to where they can find more information or like continue the practice. Do you have any sort of free-flowing drop-in, drop-out thing? So like I said, I was in the <laughs> alpha mm-hmm. and uh, there was there was great parts about it, but part of my problem with it was that like I felt a portion of it was just not anything that I... I felt was very useful for me at the time. Mm-hmm. And if it was more like something where I could drop into a, a course Alex is running on street epistemology or maybe like a later 201 or 301 one once I've gone through the earlier ones or if you did or if someone did one on nonviolent communication, that might be interesting too. But I don't want to like have to necessarily join the other classes too that I don't find as interesting. But on the other hand, then I don't want to lose touch with my cohort either. There was just, you know, 
there were a few things uh, specifically. I, so I really like David Yusuf's one on um, style. Mm-hmm. I think style is very important. I think uh, everyone should have some basics to style, know how to get clothes that fit you, and all that. Can I, you're very but, stylish I, already, so. right? But that was the thing. Like I, I didn't, I didn't have anything. I felt like I already knew all the basics, and he was covering the basics, and so I was like, I don't, you know, this is this is good info, but I don't have anything to learn here. What's what's a good combo or compliment what's the opposite of that a good other side of that coin is that i didn't have a sense of fashion and, and it, helped you. it helped me a lot mm-hmm. i i'm wearing fairly relaxed clothes today but they're not you know blue jeans and a ill-fitting t-shirt like i've definitely seen your style like become more creative since and, you took that course and conscientious of you like oh yeah really like cool i can advertise now. those shoes i've received <laughs> more compliments for those shoes that i have over there than i have <laughs> Probably for any, like you know like just generic comp- stranger compliments than I have for like anything in my entire life. And did that improve like, the quality of your life? Yeah, I've, I've had at least half a dozen compliments on those shoes, and as somebody who averaged probably like one random compliment a year for like the last thirty years, it's been really cool. I expect you've probably already told David, but if you haven't, he'd I'm sure he'd be really happy to hear that. Not about the shoes in particular, but about the fashion stuff. Okay. Yeah, but I I'll, guess follow sure question: Would you have taken that uh, course if it had been like a free form drop in drop out thing, or was the fact that you were forced to take all of them? actually instrumentally it's hard to say um i might have taken it you know it if it's free form drop in drop out this i mean this does raise a couple of questions like uh whose cohort would it be in if you're only gonna be in for three weeks yeah that's a um, the cohorts you know, were the best part can i can i pay 10 bucks for to watch all the lectures on fashion and not pay to or you know just if i want just those ones and nothing else right um yeah yeah so sorry, I don't. I mean, no, no, no. These these are kind of like questions to you as yeah. the. Yeah, we just threw a bunch of things on no, you without a chance. No, to... that's that's, and this is great. And I mean, I think this is why we're calling this the beta and not the launch because um, some of this is going to have to be hammered out. Like for example, it may be the case that you you know you need to sort of have you have your core cohort, and then you're like, look, look, folks, I'm you know I'm I'm on vacation for the next month. I can't be in the class, or or just. I don't, I'm not interested in this class. And then maybe there's a, a sort of ad hoc cohort that needs to be formed for the duration of that class where it's just the, it's just the people, you know, it's, it's made out of a subset of people who are interested in that class. And then that, that ad hoc cohort would, you know, dissolve again afterward and you, and, and then your, your core cohort is, is there for, you know, on the off chance that everybody's interested or, you, you know, you try to keep people together. Let, let's put it that way. You try to keep people together unless you just kind of can't for some reason from the same cohort i mean but th- these are things where we're just going to have to figure it out and see how it goes and honestly i like i would even prefer to push this sort of decision down to y'all because it's it's like okay you're in that situation fine like like find find a cohort to be with or maybe we have some kind of channel in the discord that that's just like uh if if your cohort isn't invested in this course then put up your slash LFG looking for group flag um, to uh, uh, to join a different cohort for the duration of the class. Um, I, I think something like that would work fine. And, and I'm, I'm actually, generally speaking, I'm just, I, I'm like, I, I, prefer, I prefer like just the right am- amount of structure, no more, no less. Let people organize, let people experiment. Like I kind of see the, the guild leaders call ourselves the, the council um, and we wear, uh, we wear funny hats to meetings. <laughs> um, but we see ourselves as like the first cohort and like every, well like we would like to see other like we would like to see the cohorts try their own weird things and do their own experiments and maybe some cohort will discover some you know innovation of how to do this rationalist training stuff that we end up adopting into the the guild because i mean i i like i don't i don't want to stifle people's attempts to to try new things um i wanted to mention though like what the other courses were that we have planned for the beta just to see how other people might be interested in that so um uh, practical decision theory and then um alex is teaching an updated version of his uh character sheet module which which he has kind of refactored and streamlined after getting feedback teaching in the alpha really long yeah that th- th- like I-, I think you know we got a lot of very helpful feedback on that one because it seemed like people um got got a lot out of it but there were definitely things that were more high impact than others so i think he's focusing on those things and making it a bit simpler cool. uh, and then we have two courses um which i think are, are very interesting because i think it really kind of speaks to what the guild is about one of them is about body language and one of them is about um how to how to create uh a, a strong social group which is being taught by david yusuf um so the reason i say that these speak to what the guild is about is because like you know, when we talk about rationality, we often talk about like epistemic versus instrumental, which is perfectly, you know, good and useful. 
dichotomy, but I'm kind of interested in what I have come to see as like the technical versus humanistic divide. Mm. And I think that we actually focus as a group of people, at least um, among the, the, the council, we think more and talk more and focus more on kind of the more humanistic aspects. So I'm, you know, I'm teaching the technical decision theory course, but then we have these two courses that are more, you know, body language, social groups, like, like interpersonal rationality is maybe a, a word for it. Yeah, I think there's already a lot of, I'm not sure what the word would be, but like informational material out there in the rationalist community about the non-interpersonal stuff, the more technical stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think it's actually probably well calibrated to do more interpersonal stuff. I know that that tends to be when I talk to people in the community, uh, what they wish there was more Hmm. uh, informational material about, like how do I do friends? How do I do conversations? Oh, thinking about doing a how do Yeah. Because I do it. Maybe, Sounds like you're volunteering to teach a course. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I am. We, we can talk about this more after the episode. Um, but the so I don't know. I, I, I agree with you. But also, like, I would really like to know how to get better at statistics and st- st- statistical modeling, especially after reading so many uh, Scott Alexander posts where he's like, and here's some graphs and here's some stats. And <laughs> this is, you know, after reading these these various uh, studies, what I got from it. And I'm like, damn, I wish I knew how to do that. And technically, I know I could go online, take long courses on statistics, but I don't want to. <laughs> what I want to do is hang out with a bunch of friends who are like-minded and have one of them who's particularly smart at statistics go and teach the rest of us how to do this thing. So I guess if Work any mathematicians kind of are thing. listening. Yeah, that is uh, the kind of like info stuff that I know could be discovered other ways, but I'd much rather have it in like sort of a guild structure. That's something I was thinking about with the pop into a course and then, you know, just do that and leave is that the camaraderie of the of the cohorts was something that I really enjoyed about it. We met once a week, uh, usually for like half an hour of of chatting or you know additional stuff relating to the class or some something that someone's working on, and then like an hour of just hanging out. We did a lot of like Jackbox games and stuff, and those it was just a it was a fun social aspect to it that you know it it's it's tough because I guess I'm trying to think of like if I had to sign up and then you know, yes, you have to take all the classes. It's like, you might as well just go to school. And that sucks for all the reasons that school sucks. It's like, I, I want to learn just about body language and decision theory. I don't want to have to learn the other five courses you guys are teaching. Why are you guys making me pay for, you know, take all these courses, you know, like if, it, if it's the school model, but you're missing out on the thing that school pretends to be another thing that schools pretend to be about, which is the social stuff. Um, but where it's actually Does real in this, in this to sense. Be that? I don't think they do. They, they networking, you know, mm, maybe if I was in a frat, right. that might have been a real thing, but... Um, I hear it a lot that school is supposed to teach you how to be socialized, which... Well, once they were unable to keep up with the facade that they taught you how to do things, they're like, no, no, <laughs> right. we, we teach you how to hang out with people. Yeah. <laughs> By forcing all, like, people of different social backgrounds just into a classroom together and making them interact a lot. Yes. Well, I mean, the kind of director Without any in the instruction classroom. as to how to do it. Right. <laughs> also on very little sleep. Uh... But I actually, I missed if there was an answer yet, or if that was what you guys were still talking about. Uh, is are you like required to take all the courses, or is there going to be some kind of system where you could selectively do two or something? Yeah, the the, the answer is um, we, we we will have to hammer out exactly how we deal with this over the course of the beta. But okay. you know, if you if you if you can't or don't want to attend a course, you won't be booted out of the the <laughs> guild. It, it'll be something more like okay, well. Um, in order to make, you know, a full cohort, in order to attend, attend the class, maybe we'll have to move some people around temporarily. Okay, so the answer is that that's one of the things you're going to try to find out. God, I feel I feel for you. As an extremely lower stakes position, I am the guild leader of a guild in World of Warcraft. <laughs> and just the headache of trying to get everyone to show up and be in their assigned roles at the assigned time is... I was like, someone's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm out this week on vacation with my family. I'm like, well fuck, now I got to get someone else to cover that role. And yeah. yeah. Sounds like somebody should teach a class on managing people. I, uh. I don't know how. <laughs> <laughs> that would be useful. It uh, would be useful. People are hard. But I mean, like, if, if someone is wants to be part of a cohort, because I love the cohorts, they're awesome. But like, if I don't want to go to a specific course, now Matt's job is to find someone else to be in there instead. And then the cohort yeah. gets messed up and yeah. it's a nightmare I, I i feel for you man well i mean ideally we find some way of, of like letting this take care of itself organically which and it's like what do you what does that mean matt how's that like i don't know like like <laughs> uh, hopefully we can figure out a way of doing things where it doesn't require like constant micromanagement because 
Um, I, I just don't, you know, think that's, that's sustainable, actually. I mean, if this thing grows, like, that's one kind of fun thing to talk about is like, hey, we actually started a, a corporate entity. If this thing grows, we can actually conceivably have people who work on this full time. I mean, hmm. CFAR can afford that. Um, but, um, and, and then, then you're talking about kind of a whole different thing when you have people whose, whose job it is to take care of us. I would absolutely love to have that be my job. I don't think that you're probably there yet. <laughs> no, you say that no. now, wait until you're in the organization. No, I think I would actually love that. That's like sort of a dream, uh, mm-hmm. being like a teacher slash student of rationalist techniques would be pretty like utopian future <laughs> for me and probably for other people out there. So yeah, I really... I'm excited and looking forward to it and hope that it continues to grow and become stronger. Uh, so, so tied into the idea that, that we should be practicing our skills and kind of leveraging on the martial arts metaphor, we've been working on, on something like a, a, a skill advancement system, or you could call it a belt system, and we, we usually call it the belt system when we're talking informally, even though I don't think we're going to be giving out cloth I was belts. going to ask, do you get an actual belt? Um, I mean, it would be <laughs> cool. I, I, th- I think one idea we've had is, is like when you advance, you just like pick some trinket to wear, and then that's your <laughs> thing. Um, but no, I mean, m- more, more seriously, we've been trying to work on the idea of, of, of how to how to do that actually right because it's sort of more obvious in a martial arts context where it's like like number one can you like win a fight <laughs> versus someone let on a lower rank than you and then number two like 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 there's, there's some criterion of like can you do these moves can you execute this form at an adequate level of skill are you saying like you want the belts to represent actual skills and not just i have like you know, I completed this many courses. Yes. <laughs> oh, they could be like links in the Game of Thrones, the Maester <laughs> series. Like for every subject that you mastered, you would get a link to add to your chain. I was imagining that was like a different a, alloy or something, yeah. depending on what you sort of cool. Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, like badge system where you get your like statistics badge. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. This, I was this sounds really too. fun. Because then that you, you could also wear those on video calls or whatever. Badges are cool, but are they as cool as fucking metal links in a chain you wear? It sounds less practical. <laughs> like I, I could put some of my like badges on my backpack or something, and then like wear it in public, and it wouldn't just be like, "What? Why the hell are you wearing a chain?" Because <laughs> I'm a gangster, I suppose. <laughs> Bayesian gangster. I, I, like, sorry, I said that you were fashionable earlier. I don't. <laughs> I know I'm wearing shorts right now, and everyone's like, "Oh God." Uh, At least they're in cargo shorts. And yeah, it's just very fashionable. Shorts? Maybe just not right now, but yeah. I, have seen, I have seen you be fashionable. <laughs> okay, thank you. When you go to the golf club, for when example. I try, yeah. yeah. I mean that, but anyway, that the um, the belt system is more a thing that I think we'll implement over the course of of the beta, and you know, I, I think you know mer- the merit badge concept where you get you know a representation of like you have completed this course. That's one thing, but another thing is like, do you pass a certain like what you would call basic minimum threshold of competency across a broad range of skills? Hmm. Like you don't want people walking around wearing you know, a purple belt, um, <laughs> and, and like being obviously bad at things that you would just think of a rationalist or really any competent, uh, well-rounded human being, um, you know, needing to be good at. And so, and that's, that's one thing is like, yeah, like in martial arts, you get a belt when you're able to prove that you can do a thing yeah. in front of an audience, Yeah, which probably feels really cool for the person and then also actually represent something. Yeah. So we're, we're tying this all into the courses where, where we actually have this explicit system where, um, the courses are actually uh, uh, tied to the the values of the organization, which which I actually you know it's funny I, I see this as being unique because every every organization has their list of values that they have on their letterhead, and no one knows what they are, and certainly the values never come into play in any actual decision making. Um, but we actually put a lot of thought into our you know our um, organization's values. Sorry, can you explain a little bit more about that? Sure. So so we actually have our, our values. The the values of the Guild of the Rose are honesty, effectiveness, courage, empathy, and cooperation. Which uh, again we we put a lot of thought into, and they they actually somewhat map onto the twelve virtues of rationality. Uh-huh. Um, but there are also some some angles where they're they're not quite the same. And so every new course has to sort of fit into the value structure and be addressing some aspect of the value structure somehow. And if it's not, then we try to figure out how it can. Um, Is this new or was that um, already decided upon in the alpha phase? Um, I think it was decided upon in the alpha phase, but but it, at the time it was just like, okay, you know, every organization has to have values, so we had some values. <laughs> and since then we, you know, we, we've actually been like, okay, but like we care about this and in, in, in the interest of not, again, not letting the tail wag the dog, you want to actually have some grounding in like 
what are we doing actually? And it's like, okay, well, we, we agreed that, that these are the values. These are the things we want to focus on. And so every course that we teach, which is the bread and butter of what we're doing, uh, is going to um, be expressing these values somehow. And then you could even look at the cohorts and say the cohorts express the values of, you know, cooperation, empathy. Is it to a di okay to digress just the tiniest bit? Of course. You just use the term, not let the tail wag the dog as if you understood what that meant. Uh -huh. And I hear that term a lot. And I do not understand what it means. Can you help? So, so, um, I'm basically the way I was trying to use it was, was to say, we don't want to let the, uh, what we, whatever happens to be happening in the guild dictate our decisions. We want to have a, a, an idea in mind of where we're heading and that dictates the decisions. Um, isn't that the same as sort of good heart? It's sort of the same uh, as it's the same idea. Yeah. I would say. Is that usually how the term is used? Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, so, so you, have you seen the movie wag the dog? I have not. So number one, it's a great movie, Okay. <laughs> but but it's a great example of the concept. I don't think anybody in the movie actually says the phrase, hmm. but like that's a movie about a, a political race where uh, the, the media coverage comes to like dictate the decisions that the politicians are making. Okay. So the example here is like the media coverage, which should be some extraneous flappy thing that's reacting to what the dog is doing comes to actually control the actions of the politician slash the dog. Interesting. Okay. Like if you could make your dog actually happy by grabbing his tail and wagging it. Okay. Right. Rather than it wagging his tail when it's happy is where that comes from. All right. That's much cleaner than all that bullshit I just said. <laughs> no, no, but the, but that, but that's a real example. Well, yeah, well the movie yes. is a hypothetical example, but it's yeah. a real world one that we can relate to. Whereas for a lot of dogs, if you grab their tail and shake it, they might actually become happy and this kind of ruins the, the <laughs> wait, the, really? They might think you're playing with them. I, I don't know. Dogs, oh, okay. dogs tend to respond happily to almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Sorry about the digression. No, that's 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 uh, that's great. So, how long do you think the beta is going to take? Well, so the way it's planned right now, we have those four courses, and they're going to take between three and five weeks each. And then after that, the plan currently actually is we just. By that point in time, we hope to have learned enough where we just say, okay, now the beta is over. Now we're just launching. Yeah. And, and, so, and so then we'll just have more courses queued up by that time and it'll just go, you know, and uh, that'll be it. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be fully functional as a, yeah, the, the beta you could even just call kind of a soft launch. Ooh, there'll have to be some way in three years, someone hears about this. They're like, oh, I want to, I want to start this. Mm -hmm. They can't just jump in wherever the courses are in twenty. 24 right they'll want to start from the courses now well they they probably could i mean so i'm guessing that if a course is really good they'll the person will want to keep teaching it mm -hmm. right it's not like at a university to... yeah so so i I've, I've thought about this actually um so my current plan again this is the cool thing about the about the flip classroom model is like let's say that i want to teach the decision theory course like once a year or something like that well, okay, all the material that I made for the course is always there. You can literally read it anytime or, or watch the YouTube videos or do the assignments anytime. But it's only once a year that we're going to be doing the cohort-oriented group, you know, uh, uh, group-oriented discussion and, and, and uh, work through of the material. And then I could even do something, and I haven't decided, like, we haven't decided that we're doing this necessarily, but I could even do a thing where, like, once a month, I would have like office hours and what that would mean is like I'm just going to be in a Zoom channel or a Discord channel I guess it would be and if you're interested in talking about the material uh, in whatever way then you can just show up during the office hours and we can talk about it um and and that and that would be fun and that would be useful I mean I I think I would even enjoy that because you know one of the reasons I wanted to teach this is actually to learn because like I know like I have this strong feeling that like decision theory specifically is a thing that we that, that like can be implemented in our lives to help us make better decisions and be more effective um and it's it's like uh nobody has really implemented that in a way that i'm happy with so i'd love to see people try to do it and come back to me and tell me what they tried what worked what didn't work um and then we can actually develop that you know praxis have you considered having like a petition system where people sign up they say i want to do this course and once there's enough of a critical mass you can be like all right there's enough of you i'll go ahead and do the whole course thing again next month that'd be a great idea or just okay. sort of not wanting to teach a thing but suggest a thing that they would want to be taught uh like you... upvoting class ideas or something yeah, that, that'd be a cool idea too yeah because I'm, I'm sure there's yeah the hard part there would be if they want something esoteric but none of the uh shoot what is the high 
order of yeah, the, the the council. The council. If the if the council if there's no council expert on I don't know insert random thing. I'm trying to think of a good example. So I guess between the six of you, there's probably not much that you guys couldn't find a way to talk about well, well, slash learn enough to teach about. So I, sorry, I didn't I didn't even mention that one of the courses that we're teaching the the body language course is being taught by um, a guild member named Olivia who was in the alpha but is not. On the Olivia council. was in my cohort. She was oh. awesome. Oh, great. Um, but yeah, so so you don't have to be on the council to be a teacher. You could be anybody as long as, you know, you have a credible case to be made that you, you know, know enough about it. to. Um, and I, like, I think that's the best way to, to go about this. And other things we, we've talked about is, okay, yeah, when, when we're, when we have enough income, every, if everybody wants a course on a certain subject, then we could actually hire a subject matter expert to teach that course rather than have, have a community member do it. That's obviously... A ways down the road but that's a possibility so what is the time commitment per week for this sort of thing so right now we're looking at a target of one hour for the course session per week and then uh aiming for asking of you no more than one hour of reading slash youtube video slash homework per week um it may be the case that you'll like want to put in more time than that depending right on your level of interest um on the other hand you could you know kind of half-ass your homework and like j just get through it and I, I don't see that that would be the worst thing in the world um uh and and then aside from that you know if, if the cohorts are working the way they're supposed to then you'll probably want to spend time in the in the, you know, in the discord uh, hanging out or, or playing games or what have you like like steven was talking about but i mean the aim so, so so in the in the alpha there was some feedback that was basically like this is more work than i signed up for was kind of what what we what I heard from a few people who I talked to. I did kind of an exit interview for a group of people, and um and we and so the reaction was like, okay, one hour per week of course session, one hour per week of homework, and that's that's two hours per week, which I I think I think is a reasonable ask. It's, it's like if look if you if you're putting in less than two hours per week on something that's allegedly supposed to be educating you, then I don't see that you're going to get any real value out of that. So why bother? I would hope that the people who thought it was too big of a time commitment, I mean. Maybe it was just because there's nothing advertised to them beforehand of how much they should expect to spend on it. Mm -hmm. Maybe that was the issue. Because, I mean, I again, if it's if I'm taking a night class for whatever thing, if, even if it's just one subject, mm -hmm. I would expect to spend a few hours a week on it, you know? Some of them, like, I thought the characters, a lot of work. Like, with the night class, I guess you're getting a credential. If you're like, here's some credits that I can show my employer, even if I didn't learn. If I'm doing it for, like, my own learning, though, right? Like, there are a lot of um, open enrollment online classes for insert computer subject here and they are actually taught live you attend the sessions and stuff and it gives you some estimate of how many hours you can expect to spend working on it you know, i suppose you could tell your boss yeah i completed this you know random course but that's not like there's not room in a resume to put some random line like that right I it's, guess... it's more just like i want to learn more about data science using python yeah. oh look there's a there's a course hosted by uh mit's like open uh school thing right so well, I think that's very much where the self-motivation thing comes from. And also probably the drop in it when you really want to learn something. Yeah. I'm assuming the homework and video is beforehand and then the one hour session is later where you talk about what you learned and or the work you did. Yes. Right. So, so you know, right now I'm making the course material for my course, which basically means I'm making scripts and, and YouTube videos and, and written sort of what you would find in a textbook, except ideally written more concisely. Um, and, you know, some of it is going to be pointers to stuff that already exists. Like, that's one thing is, like, I don't see any reason why, uh, uh, you know, you need to generate all of your own content. If you know, like, hey, uh, three blue, one brown already made the best video on Bayesian updating that, that will ever exist. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> just just go watch that and we'll all talk about it together, you know. Um, is that a real uh, video yeah. that I should watch? It's a, Yeah, he's a, he's a math I'm YouTuber. I'm taking a note. Yes. Three blue is one brown. And, uh, three blue, one brown. And I believe, I mean, that's going to be literally in the syllabus. So, um, um, you know, and, and the, the, I don't know, this is a tangent really, but it, it's one of my good friends is a, is a college professor. And he, he says this, this line, which maybe kind of sounds like a deepity, but basically it's, it's just, you can't teach people things. They have to learn it. <laughs> and, and what he means is like, pe people want you to have like the perfectly efficient, perfectly packaged way of saying the thing so that it just clicks into their brain and they're just like oh yes i know that now right. and it's like in reality like if you think about anything that you would consider yourself expert on you spend hundreds of hours 
dicking around with it yeah. and and wasting and like, wasting time right like there and it, it is inefficient it's just it just is inefficient to learn especially to master things so the idea of having a, a structure you know flipped classroom model structure is like look here's here's the pointers to the things that I think are important that we're, that we're going to be spending time talking about. But definitely if you want to master decision theory, you're not going to do that in two hours a week. You need to put in your own time. You need to use this as a trailhead for your journey of discovery into decision theory. Um, and that's going to be true literally no matter what, you know, whether you're talking about actually going, getting a college degree or attending a, you know, online continuing education thing. A MOOC. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So I had some questions. Sure. Uh, I was sort of asking you about this before we got on, but I realize other people might wonder this. Uh, I was wondering if there's some way I could like be somebody's minion or just like volunteer to do, uh, maybe not teaching a class, but like help with the other logistics. Um, if anybody else wanted to like be like, hey, I want to help with X thing, uh, who should I ask about that? And what i guess more details about that sure so so one important role which which we are open to people volunteering for specifically is basically to be um the what we're calling the cohort facilitator which is a sort of you know temporary leader that you would say like you know okay we're teaching the decisions theory course there needs to be one person in a cohort who is you know the discussion leader basically who is the person who um uh, knows the topic, the talking points of like, you know, what we're trying to get through today. And, you know, uh, if, if it's going to be a discussion where everybody presents their own personal piece of homework or whatever, then that person is the person in charge of saying, all right, like now, now it's your turn. Now it's your turn. Now it's your turn and, and keep the discussion going. Um, so that's one kind of role and there's going to need to be as many of those as there are cohorts. Mm -hmm. Um, and if people don't volunteer for that, then we're basically going to have to tap someone. Um, and and then if there's like a specific thing that you think you can help about help with, then just directly contact one of the council members um, via you know private message or or just yeah you can just send an email to council at guildoftherose.org. And yeah, I gotta say like having those sorts of volunteer organ positions is just a great way to build any organization or community. I've volunteered at some cons before and. There's, I don't know, you want to go to a con, you want to meet people, you want to have a good time. Um, specifically, I'm thinking about um, SF Lit Cons for me, but, you know, Comic Con, whatever. But you're kind of a, a nerdy, introverted person. You don't know what to do. You're just going to stand around and look at everyone else having fun. God, the best thing ever is just volunteer. Be like, hey, mm -hmm. can you use me for anything? And they're like, sure. Then you feel like you have a purpose for being there. Yeah. And then you get to meet all your other volunteers. And also you feel like you got like... A little more investment. It's just, it's, it's a yeah. great feeling. And that is also where like the leadership is like, okay, this people, this person helped us out at the last con. They were really good. Maybe like we can pull them up into something higher. Mm -hmm. It's like, ah, oh, it's just wonderful. Benefits all around. Yeah. And yeah, like life hack. I actually like doing that at parties. If I like don't know anybody at a party or feeling anxious, I'll just go find whoever's house it is or whatever. Be like, is there something I could do to help you? Like, can I make drinks for people? Can I like clean things? Oh, no. And then, yeah, you also feel like, okay, I know what I'm doing at this party, and you're not just sort of wandering around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. the knowing what you're doing and having a purpose helps it. Yeah. Uh, sort of relatedly, uh, you said there was a, like, what was it, su a suggested $15 um, get, yeah. like donation or whatever. Um, yeah. But what if people want to give you more money? <laughs> you totally can, so there's a Patreon now. That's, that's what I was going to ask, yeah, or, or maybe not even not join, but just if they want to, like, support the cause. Yeah, and you could, yeah, I mean, you can just use the Patreon for... Um, any, any, literally any amount the, the, the official, you know, tier for full membership is $15 a month. But, um, um, that's, you know, that's basically a number where we, we feel like if, if we have sustained growth in membership and people are paying that amount, then we'll be able to provide some pretty cool benefits to people. But, um, th that, yeah, that's where we are right now anyway. Yeah. But if someone just wants to throow money at you also, cause they hear this episode and think that, well, that's a cool thing that should exist. Uh, is, do you have like that Patreon link on your website? Or? Yeah. It's, it's at the bottom of every page under that little P symbol. Um, and also you can just go to patreon.com slash guild of the rose. Um, and it'll, it'll land you right there. Um, I wonder, do do people know that that the that Rose is a, is an acronym which stands for um, anything that you can fit it to? <laughs> I am aware of that. I'm not sure how I feel about it. <laughs> not, Wait. not actually standing for anything in particular. Please explain, because I don't, I haven't heard this. So if you if you load the guildoftherose.org, or sorry, guildoftherose.org, not the, um, it, it'll load uh, an acronym 
which oh, a random generated a random, a random, well not not randomly generated but from a list of ones that we thought of okay let me honestly it's a list of acronyms that i had gpt3 think of <laughs> um which was amazing that it could do that by the way i just said like a bunch of acronyms for rose and then uh, the, uh, having to do with a rationalist organization and it spit out like and i made it give me like 300 and i picked the ones that i thought were good i oh, need to awesome. play with gpt3 more mm-hmm. which uh, version are you using uh, the one that's you can access via uh, open AI, uh, via AI dungeon. Okay, um, yeah, the AI dungeon one via the back door. Give us an example of one. Uh, the one that's on the page right now is rarely offers stupid explanations. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And GPT three thought of that. I think so. That's terrifying. I love it. it is, I mean, I don't. I can't guarantee that GPT three thought of all of these, but they were all roughly this good. I like the rarely qualifier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we can't guarantee anything. Right. Uh, I was wondering. Because you said you hinted, strongly hinted at, and almost tried to recruit uh, some people here at, that there's a way for someone to run their own kind of like, hey, here's a thing I know I can try to help teach other people it. Yeah. A course. Like, how would you go about pitching your own course to the council? Um, I mean, if, if you contact us directly or, or via the, the email address that I mentioned um, with a the proposal, then that at least gets you on the radar. And then, so I, I am actually the course content director. That's my title. Um so I would be the number one person to directly con- contact about that. But anyone you contact will, uh, it'll, it'll get to me. Um, and, and then it becomes, you know, okay, so we need to kind of onboard you into our process because, uh, you know, it, it's going to have to follow the way that we're doing things where it's, you know, flipped classroom model. You have to have your materials ready. You have to be organized in a certain way. And, you know, you have to orient things around the fact that this is going to be a cohort discussion that you you're not necessarily going to have any part of right which is a very kind of unusual way of thinking about teaching right that actually makes me less anxious because i have uh taught like art classes uh at the library and i expected maybe 10 people to show up and i showed up and there were 40 people and they had a like overhead projector that i had to like put my stuff out i was just like oh (laughs) no i have really bad stage fright and also nobody in the back can hear me. And I got to set up the sound system. And now I have anxiety about having a mic on me. And uh... mm-hmm. <laughs> so actually, I love the idea of just uh, maybe like take a video of myself teaching it and then like throw it out into the wild and people can watch it if they want. But I don't have to be standing there shaking and trembling. Sure. <laughs> right. Each time for hours. It seems kind of ridiculous that we still even teach things via the method of person stands up in front of group and, and says words instead of just having a a much more optimized pre-prepared they should at least package. only have to do that once right yeah. yeah i mean i think the real use case for that is like look i'm the expert i'm here so that you can ask me questions and get right. clarification not just me say things and write equations on a chalkboard because mm-hmm. you can get the equations out of a book yes and you should get that talk off a ted talk or something like if you're going to be taking someone's personal time up it should be to actually interact with them rather than them give the same presentation they've given many of them yeah i love the yeah. idea of office hours actually i meant to call that out um just you know being there as a resource i think i saw someone calculate once how many man hours how many i think it was in the hundreds of millions of man hours are lost a year of people just repeating the same thing they repeated last year to the same class and the basic teachers specifically how many how many teachers there are and just thinking if you were to dedicate these hundreds of millions of man hours to almost anything else in the world just let a video do this yeah. and then even have the teachers be there and dedicate those man hours to answering questions and tutoring people instead of giving the same lecture again. Right. I love the phrase man hours. It's a really hilarious way to describe <laughs> a thing. No, I mean, that's so like, I just, I just remember my, like my high school, you know, algebra two teacher. It's like, this is like objectively worse than almost any other way that I could have absorbed this material. Even like just watch <laughs> the like online free MIT version of this, which surely exists. I think I think I personally may be a very selfish person. Again, speaking of the whole I like social interaction thing, I much more valued being in the same room as my teacher and like getting to see them give the presentation. Like I was sharing breathing space with them. I could feel the vibrations of the sound coming from their mouth and I could maybe like get noticed in some way, which you can't do with a video. The teacher senpai senpai will never notice you if he's a video recorded (laughs) ten years ago. But see this is what that attitude. This is is what I like about the about the cohort structure is you're getting that socialization. It's admittedly you're not feeling, you know, your teacher's voice through the soles of your 
of your feet or whatever, right, right. but you're you But realistically you weren't getting their attention either anyway. <laughs> Senpai noticing you is actually a very powerful force. Mm -hmm. But I think that getting your cohort to be like, Oh, that's a good idea gives you a lot of the same uh feelings. Yeah. And potentially, I mean, I I think ideally we have the course instructors, you know, visiting the different cohorts throughout the course of the discussion session and checking in. And then you could get sent to you. Oh, it I'll just makes trying. it more prestigious if they do. Mm -hmm. I'm 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 very mo I'm personally very motivated by senpai noticing me. Right. This, is, this is a major force in my life, actually. That's we all. Um, so. People like recognition. So aside from like having the class material prepped beforehand, and then having the in-person weekly meetings be um, more for. I, I, in my mind, I'm kind of dividing it into like the the lecture and the lab component for for like a college course. Mm -hmm. You know, because you can you can do the lecture part by either watching YouTube videos or reading books, right? Mm -hmm. But you can't do the lab at home at your computer, right? You need to come in and do stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, other than that being one difference, are there any other major uh, pivots the beta has made over the alpha that we haven't touched on? Um, I think uh, I don't I don't think that we haven't touched on. You know, we we talked about the idea that we that we reorganized the the council into having like specific functional roles which uh, has actually been, I guess I didn't talk about the fact that like we did that and that was actually a very good decision because now, you know, the two consoles, the people who are literally the, you know, two kind of co-CEOs of the organization are um, Errol and Alex and uh, we elected them to be the, the leaders um, and they have done a fantastic job in, in terms of like setting our priorities and, you know, pushing tasks down to the person who needs to do the task which absolutely necessary honestly in terms of an organization that actually is trying to grow and be effective um so that 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 is new um in terms of the beta is there actual title console console yes that's they're, fantastic they're the, the co-consoles yes <laughs> i sort of feel like since they were elected they should be the presidents uh we're, consoles we're, were elected too i know just it, it was a joke <laughs> <laughs> i do like the um i mean it's it's kind of remarkable that you guys got like limped through a whole kind of semester of classes with like no one's job officially being anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so that is impressive. It, the, the, the amount of, uh, of increased efficiency just by saying, Oh yeah, this is your job. Can you do this? Rather than like, who wants to do this thing uh -huh. for every task that needs doing? Uh, yeah, that sounds like a, a, a good move, yeah. but I can see how, like, it wasn't just dumb or negligent to try it the other way. You know, this was a kind of volunteer thing. We're getting this going figuring out who wants to do what sort of thing. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not putting down the previous way of doing it. I'm just... Uh, That's why you do betas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or alphas in this case. Um, you had actually mentioned before that there was somewhere you had written a post-mortem of the alpha, and I, I and probably other people would be interested in reading that. Yeah, so um, it, it's actually a less wrong post of mine, but you can currently, I, I can't guarantee this is going to be the case forever, but currently if you go to guildofthrose.org and you scroll down... Um, to the bottom of that page, you'll see a link that goes to um, a version of that, uh, uh, which is, it just says, it's a alpha retrospective is what it's called. Um, and, and I, you know, I basically what I did is I actually interviewed all of the council members one-on-one, -on -one, and then I interviewed um, a handful of um, people, uh, what's the word, alpha right. participants. Partici participants, and just kind of collated all the feedback I got and then made some recommendations based on that and that you know we've largely followed those recommendations actually nice what like the majority of lots wrong comments I've made were on that post <laughs> I think two 66.6 yeah. <laughs> yeah. percent yeah I think I commented once on uh, someone did a post on the uh, Eliezer on we want more like here's all the things that he said about the book in this episode I, if there's a few minutes to go over it, I, I was we talked briefly off air whether or not it would be workable audio, and I think Matt is eloquent enough to make it fun to listen to. Uh, an example decision tree um, to address like a real world problem that I've all, I've already kind of decided on, but maybe I'll do this and change my mind. It's not too late. So oh, yeah, and Charlie had also asked for some teaser content, so I think this is good. Perfect. Yeah, and so so I don't know if I can guarantee that we're going to make an actual decision tree because that's much more of a visual concept. But we can hammer through the approach that I would that I would take um, toward a problem like this. Um, so so you're coming to us with a decision in your life that you're facing, and you say you've already made the decision. But let's, for the sake of argument, say that you could still change your decision. Nothing's been signed yet, so yeah. I, I still could. Yeah. The, the technical definition of decision is that the decision has only been made once resources have been irrevocably allocated perfect i'm not at that stage yet then so okay. the i am 
in the process of deliberating between taking a new job or keeping my current one. And okay. so what sort of, you know, hey guys, I've got this, this, this is my dilemma. What do I, how would yeah. you guys go about helping me work out my ideal decision here? So the first thing that I would say is, is that, you know, every decision is subjective. And so I, I have to, I have to say like, is this a decision that you have, you know, struggled with that you've lost sleep over? Uh, meta- yes. Metaphorically lost yeah. sleep. Yeah. Okay. So, so then I would say, what are the specific things that you're worried about? And you can just list those. Yeah. Um, I currently like, I mean, in general, this is the broad stroke of anyone changing a job. Like the thing, you know, or if you don't like a job, the double, you know, versus the one you don't, right? What if the next job isn't as good in the fun aspects or the team aspects or whatever, right? Um, so there's that. Um, you know, I, I I don't know how useful it is to get super specific, but I guess it is my example. So, uh, you know, I right now I'm, I'm an integral part of a very small team. I will be eventually an important part of a small team at the next company, but I like being super valuable. I, it turns out because I wasn't I wasn't that valuable a year ago, and I like feeling important. Okay. Yeah. That is a pretty. Yeah. Most I also like getting like paid. What was that? <laughs> Most people like that. Yeah. I well, some people I think like flying under the radar, and they you know don't want to be counted on for stuff, right? But um, it turns out I enjoy that. I also like money, and yeah. the new job has more of that. So yeah. Yeah. Most people also like money. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So so I think um one one thing that I that I plan to emphasize is is the idea that we're focusing on the practical side of practical decision making. So you could probably list uh, more bullet points, right? But but I think if those are the things that are gnawing on you, the you know, you basically listed four things. We should probably break down those four things and if you don't feel better after that, or if you don't feel like the decision is clear after that, then you can move on to further bullet points. But but you know, usually usually there's one or two key things actually that I would say. You know, there's some there's some implicit trade off being made that that you're f- just having trouble getting your head around. Um, so you know, you basically said like, what if the job itself isn't as fun? What if the social aspect of the job is worse? Um, what if you you know you don't have as much kind of centrality to the project? You lose a sense of, of meaning and the money question of you know, how how and that like this is a classic example to my mind because essentially you're trading off money against what you could call like ineffable sacred values like how important i feel and it's right like, well, how many dollars is feeling important worth to you how do you answer that well and in this case it's even a little more twisted than that because it's a probability of an ineffable sacred mm-hmm. value right i might be as important and have as much fun with the team slash social aspect whatever at the next job but those are unknowns mm-hmm. so how much money would it take to get me to Throw that dice. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So so the first step, which is what you just did, is, is you break it down into the specific distinctions that you're worried about. So each of those four things I would call a a, a, a distinction or, or a point at which you would make a distinction. So you would break down like, okay, what am I actually worried about? I'm worried about maybe you could frame it as right now I'm having a lot of, of like social interaction that are, that are positive. I'm worried that I could have just like a, a, a bad, a bad social um, context in the next job, like bifurcated in that way, where you're like, okay, well, th- then you ask yourself, like, okay, what? Um, so, so, so sorry. Let me let me go back. So you would go through each of these, and you would say, like, what what is the thing that I have now versus the other branch of the tree, which would be what is the bad version of this that I'm worried about that's keeping me up at night? And the point would be, like, you, you'd probably be okay if if the if the context you're going into is like. 95% as good as the context you have now. What you're really worried about is that it'll actually suck, right? right. So so you, you, you break everything down into a dichotomy where possible. This, in some situations, the dichotomy is not actually possible, but you try to turn it into a dichotomy of like what I have now, good versus what I could have, bad, um, or, 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 you know, depending on the situation, right? So, so here's the thing. We, be, we immediately begin to get into nuances because maybe you'll want to say, okay, branch one is... Um, as good as I have now or better. And then branch two is anything worse than what I have now. That might be something that you, so, so it's up, it's literally up to you in terms of where you want to break it down. Because if you're losing sleep over it, you need to be the one who specifies what are you worried about? Yeah. Are you saying by a dichotomy that you're asking yourself, like you're taking your list of worries and making them, what is the bad outcome of this thing that I'm worried about versus what's like the possible benefit that I could get? Yes. Yes. Um, and there, there are other tricks to employ. I, 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 you know, in this sort of teaser, I don't want to go into the full like mathematical treatment of how you break everything 
down. But basically the, the step here is you would end up with, you know, each of these four things, potentially, if these four things are all really important to you, you break them down into like the better and worse. And then you would do um, an exercise, which is really frankly going to be impossible to do over audio, but you'd break everything down into like preference ordering from best to worst possible outcome where it's kind of obvious that the best possible outcome is like you're making more money, you still feel valuable, you still have a good social life in your in your team and um, your job is fun, right? But then, and, and then the worst possible case is also kind of obvious where it's like the worst possible case. But then how you rank order the other possibilities in the middle actually begins to matter. And then you do a sort of mathematical exercise where you actually assign numerical values to these. And it's not, it's kind of important to say, I think, even in context of a teaser, like the way you do that is not just how important does this feel to you. Um, there's a certain tool, a certain mathematical tool where uh, you turn each decision into a sort of bet where you're saying, would I rather just have choice A or would I rather have the option to flip a coin and get choice B or choice C? And I know that might make like no sense he hearing it said like that, um, it's the sort of thing where it's like it's math. I don't know how to say math concepts, but <laughs> you, you sort of find the weighting where you're comfortable with that trade-off, where it's just like balance. And then it's like, okay, whatever that number is, that's the number that corresponds to your preference. So anyway, you, you, you've, now, you've now established a preference ordering over these outcomes with numbers attached. Then you go through the course of, of estimating, okay, well, what are the odds that your next job is going to like be like a, a extremely boring and suck compared to how much you're having fun now? And then so like... I'm not going to make you do all these right now, but like, what what are what are your subjective odds in, in a percentile score that that you think your next job is going to like be substantially less fun than this one? Yeah, no, this is this is great, and I don't think that you lost me on the the math adjacent talk before. I mean, like this this is where I can imagine some people would have already made their decision. They look at the um the, just by laying this out, and then they they find okay, the real crux is say the the fun component. Mm -hmm. And then, they, and then they look at this, well, with a trade-off of knowing that I'll make this much more, I'd be willing to take a 90% chance of this being half as fun. Mm -hmm. And then like, oh, that was my decision. That mm -hmm. was what was tripping me up. I've already, I've solved my, my um, dilemma here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in the, in the interest of being practical, if that, if that just immediately causes a weight to lift off your shoulders, then you're done. You've, you've successfully made the decision. You can move forward without regrets, right? If you did have to move forward, what we would then do is we would begin to multiply those, you know, weighted preferences by the odds, and then you'd calculate in, in a tree fashion. You calculate like what's the best and what's the worst. And the thing is, if you end up with an answer that you're fundamentally unhappy with, then that hints that you haven't actually nailed down all the things that you're worried about. But most likely, I mean, every time I've done this exercise in my life, it has number one kind of removed the weight from my shoulders because I'm like, okay, I, I I get what I'm worried about. There's at an least. equation for this. Yeah, <laughs> like I I've I've rectified the equations. I, I, I've I've thought it through, and the number is just like, yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. And then you just don't have to worry about it anymore because you know it's it's kind of counterintuitive because you know usually when you learn about decision theory in an academic context, you're just learning about like should we invest this money into this R and D project to develop a new sprocket for the thing will we make more or less money? And there's not like that emotional component yeah. that often goes along with this is an important life decision. Exactly. And I would say that when it comes to making practical decisions, it's usually the emotional component that is the obstacle, you know. Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, mo most of the time, the, a decision is obvious. Like whether you're going to go out for pancakes or stay home and have pancakes, like. But yeah, like, <laughs> I think there's like generally this failure mode of, I think I even said the same thing earlier, but like the UG field, mm -hmm. it just feels so bad when it comes up that you keep pushing it to the future and then mm -hmm. eventually you just end up flailing and maybe not making an optimal decision. But yeah, this like being able to take, not really take the emotion out of it because I feel like that's a bad way to put it, but like articulate what emotions are there mm -hmm. uh, is what this kind of exercise is really helpful for. Yeah. I mean, I've, I heard a, you know, martial arts anecdote about a guy who was grabbed on the street and then he, you know, from his perspective, just like turned around and moved his arms. And then the guy who attacked him was laid out on the ground. And it's like, okay, what actually happened is he executed yeah, a specific that muscle memory. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he did a thing, but he did it quickly and without thinking. And if, you know, if you actually train yourself in these techniques that we sort of all, you know, talk about, then the UG field doesn't even have a chance to form because you just start breaking the problem down mm -hmm. before you even have a chance to feel bad about it. You maybe become a more confident decision maker. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. Would you like to hear about a 
like fast in the sort of it, relatedly uh there's a fast version of this that i sort of developed from the decision advisor absolutely uh tool if it's something that either isn't a big deal like what are you, what am i gonna have for breakfast or uh i'm just like in a time crunch but what i'll do is make a weighted pros cons list mm. and just using intuition um assign each i actually just put tally marks next to it if i'm doing this in a scratch notebook but like i'll put a certain number of tally marks like one out of five for mm -hmm. each of those and then just do the math whether the the pros outweigh the cons based mm -hmm. on my like just intuitive tally marks and usually it gets the same feeling of confidence in the decision but you're able to uh just do it more quickly and on on the go mm -hmm. i've done it like while driving in a car which maybe isn't <laughs> ideal um i did it in my head i wasn't writing in a notebook but yeah <laughs> sure and and that's that's awesome right I, I i totally think that that qualifies as a practical decision theory application you know my goal is to teach people to be rigorous enough to do a full breakdown that a professor would find adequate if they want and then if they want to make you know approximations to that which is sort of what you're talking yeah. about, then they can totally do that. But but I, I want people to understand what approximations they're making is how I would phrase I, it. I wouldn't have actually even come up with this if I hadn't done the decision advisor one. I used mm -hmm. to just do pros, cons lists or other, I don't know, um, what other common heuristics there are for decision making, but... SWOT. Oh, tell me about one. Isn't that... that sounds uh, familiar. Um, shoot. It's like opportunity... Or the O is opportunity. It's like W-S... Or S-W-O-T... Yeah. Um, and I can't remember the rest of them. I definitely so. used to know this too. Huh? I, I'm basically pulling it from an episode of Silicon Valley where they do this and then they, they do it in a context where you probably shouldn't about whether or not to let somebody die because he, <laughs> he was an asshole. Wow. Um, I think I'm more familiar with the, what is it, the OODA loop? Yeah. 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 That's... These are probably also good tools, but I, I really like just put a number on it. Like that one tends to leave me with the most feeling of confidence because the other ones have these like too subjective, I think, criteria. Uh what was the one letter you could remember from SWOT? Uh, I'll just find the whole thing really quick. It was uh, SWOT analysis, strategic planning technique, strengths, with weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Yeah, so like a lot of that just still feels too subjective, where maybe this is just a distortion on my part, but putting numbers on things makes me go, aha, now it's math. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as far as I know, there was no, this was still just kind of like a way to visualize, like, so you, you've got this, this decision. And you're like, okay, let me just think about the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And then you look at it, and it's like all threats. And you're like, oh, okay, mm. you know, this probably isn't what I should do then, right? Mm. But if you look at, and the strengths are just, you can put way more sticky notes in the yeah. strengths uh, But quadrant. then what if there's an equal number of each of those things you could come up with, and then you're just looking at it like, uh, but like how, how much value, it, like, you know. Exactly. You do need, at some what's point. What's the probability that this threat will arise? And then yeah. how much do I care about it if it does is missing from the equation? So it still just doesn't feel like. That's why you got to take Matt's class in the beta. 100%. <laughs> in fact, for this, I'm going to, I'll just put in the, the links for the show notes, the Silicon Valley bit where they, where they work on this. Um, there was another, uh, oh, you used the word ug feel. Oh yeah. yeah. I, I don't, I don't think we to. define that. I, or oodle I, I intend to try to like be the kind of person that will include inferential distance lol in the jargon when I say it. I think we've, you know, defined that one enough. But an UG field is I think also rat jargon about it's sort of yeah, when something is unpleasant enough to think about that it motivates you to keep pushing it like to your future self. You know, like a good example or the, the common example I think is like when you receive lots of bills or just like there's something unpleasant, I don't know, like your divorce letters, like when mail just consistently is like, oh, if I open this, I'm going to have to read something that like, mean, you know, oh man, it's jury duty. Oh man, it's bill. And then like that causes people to just sort of leave stacks of mail unopened for long periods of time, which causes them to like miss paying their bills on time and then have to pay even more <laughs> or other bad things, bad outcomes. And uh, there are techniques to avoid UG feels, but it's that would be maybe a good class too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I actually think there's a ton of like less wrong posts, like like pro maybe like literally hundreds of less wrong posts where it's like, wow, this is an awesome idea. Now that I have read this, I feel like my life is going to be so much better. Yeah. And, then, and then you just like, never need to practice it. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you just never think about it again, especially not in the context where it would be useful. Um, and yeah, like so many of so so much stuff like that. You know, there's there's tons of there's tons of less wrong articles about stuff like you know the motivation equation, and I'm like, that was my favorite less wrong post. Uh, I think it was Cal Newport 
Um, or it, it might as well have been. He, well, he no, I mean, uh, somebody actually came up with the procrastination equation, and I can't remember because mm, okay. uh, I didn't get enough sleep. But I that was the first I'd heard of it. So somebody on Less Wrong did a review, and definitely we should link to that if we haven't already. Uh, taking a note right now. I feel like it was Luke Prague who wrote the review. But... It was yeah, it was definitely Luke Prague who wrote it, but it was based on a book. Uh, that I think is just called the procrastination equation. The the review and the book are both really good, and they did in fact change my life. See, that's cool because my subjective experience with that was like reading it, thinking it sounded awesome, and then like never managing to use it actually. Which I mean, you could call that my failure, and that'd probably be fair. But also, like, hey, if there was a if there was like a a course or or even just like exercises, even, yeah. even just like a small set of exercises that I had to do, that would be better than nothing. I definitely yeah like tried practicing it and it took me a while to actually do it right too because you have to i think i actually like had to go read the procrastination equation book or Mm -hmm. just find more information Mm -hmm. which is tying it back into the subject like you mentioned earlier uh that teaching a subject will also help you learn it and i Mm -hmm. found that's definitely true Mm -hmm. um trying to practice a thing will teach you yeah you what you don't know (laughs) you don't know what you don't know yeah until you try to teach it to someone and then you're like oh shit so here's all the parts where i was a little fuzzy and i just kind of papered over it yeah and now that i have to explain it to someone i'm gonna have to go and do a lot of research on it or like oh that's a good question actually uh, i don't i don't don't know yeah i realize i've thought about that yeah i realize i've never thought about how to answer that question yeah i I think i don't remember who it was it was probably um feynman because he says all the really cool stuff about learning (laughs) But he said, you don't really know something until you t- can teach it. I think he said until you, until you can teach it to your grandmother, mm. which adds a whole hurdle of... That's a big hurdle. <laughs> yeah. But but that's actually, I think, more Maybe his grandma was it, younger right? and sprier than most grandmas. I think that just came up on the inferential distance uh, subject, where sort of the explain like I'm five might be a, a, another... Yeah. Way to phrase that. Although they're both kind of insulting. <laughs> yeah, not not if you're in the spirit of it, yeah. you know. I because I, I ask for those at work sometimes. Some someone will s- demonstrate or just like drop a quick link to like something that they figured out or whatever. I'm like, wait, can you give me the explain explain like I'm five version of like what the hell this is and why it's useful? And then two sentences later, I'm like, oh, awesome, cool, got it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's maybe one reason why. So like, um, in in the discussion we had, you know probably literally years ago about you know rationalist community i was like i feel like there's like a a a form of this art that we're all sort of implicitly developing together that's just like incredibly useful and powerful and we're not really approaching it because there's no like crank that's being turned and i feel like part of that crank is what you guys are saying actually it's it's that you're you're trying to actually teach it to people seeing like oh that explanation that i thought made total sense or, you know, the explanation that's in that less wrong article, it doesn't actually connect. I need to work on that. And then you get like, you know, again, martial arts metaphor, you like you end up with the instructor who just has like the perfect way of explaining the thing. Like, yeah, you just okay, what you're not doing is you're not turning your hips when you kick. And you're like, you turn your hips when you and then you do it and you're like, Holy shit, I can kick now. <laughs> and that's like that's the thing. You have to practice teaching it to learn what the hard part of understanding it actually is yeah, and, and that would be yeah. super maybe different for a, different people too maybe mm-hmm. you don't get a link in your chain until you've actually taught the course. yeah maybe yeah. it was surprising when i tried to t- ski like the whole time i was like well just turn to the side <laughs> to, to reduce velocity and she's like how do you turn i'm like how do i turn <laughs> yes. like and i tried turning i was like oh okay i put a lot more weight on this foot and i kind of lean and okay I'm... that was a uh, there's a Pixar movie called Luca that just came out. Um, and there's this scene that I think is a really good example. <laughs> You're laughing. Matt's laughing. You've yeah. seen it. You have yeah. children. You've seen it. Yeah, no, it's a great movie. I just like watching children's movies. But uh, the there's these two kids that are like sea monsters. And if they walk on land, they'll turn human. But like the one kid's been doing this his whole life. And the other one has never done it because it's forbidden. <laughs> so the first kid's like, okay, look, I'll teach you how to walk. It's super easy. I, I basically invented it. Look, you just <laughs> you kind of put your, your your legs. You see, those are your legs, and then you... No, that's falling. <laughs> no, you gotta you gotta lead with your head, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, that's not it. No, no, you're still on the ground. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and just like, it, he started just saying less and less useful things. Yeah. It's very funny. Yeah. That's really good. All right, well, do we have any final things to say? Just remind everyone, uh, check out guildoftherose.org and that should get you started if you're at all interested uh and you know thanks so much for having me we really appreciate we being the the, you know the the (laughs) guild actually really appreciate y'all allowing us to to you know have this platform and and talk about this and of course it's fun to talk about thank you i had a lot of fun i really enjoyed uh the alpha i enjoyed 
really just what you guys are doing. Um, I, uh, Alex, I think you sent everybody in the alpha like a cut and paste, like, you know, we're starting the beta, let, you know, mm-hmm. let us know if you want to join. And I'd said, no, but I'll be following the trajectory of what you guys, like for this one, just because mm-hmm. I don't know if I want to commit to the same. Then again, now I'm learning what the time commitment is. Maybe I'll jump in. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I was going to say. I, I, didn't... Did, I did say I'll enthusiastically follow the trajectory of what you guys are doing. I think it's great. So I didn't really have plans to join the beta, but now I'm, I'm leaning strong in that direction. At the very least, I'm going to find a way to get those uh, practical decision theory lectures. <laughs> so if I have to pay for them, I will. Uh, you uh, totally have to pay for them. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. What if What if you're unemployed? Do you still have to pay for things then? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Great. If you're unemployed by decision, yes. <laughs> oh, damn it! <laughs> Aren't you financially independent? I mean, that depends <laughs> on how exactly you define that. <laughs> depends on whether or not you're asking asking me for to pay, asking for me to pay for something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's It's an interesting situation. But okay. Thank you very much. This was wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it. And this week, we are sending a special thanks out to Sayaf Ali. Thank you so much for your contributions. Yay, we Yay. love you. Sayaf Ali, was it? Sayaf Ali. That was probably pronounced perfectly. Wow. It's, yeah. it's. We like pe- you so much that we made Matt do it because so, we knew that he can pronounce names. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I know I can anyway. The only reason Matt was able to, well, not the only reason, the primary reason Matt was able here to tell everybody about the Guild of Servants beta is because of... Yeah. Sayaf Ali. <laughs> Sayaf Ali, yes. We're going to make you keep saying it each time. And therefore, uh, Matt is very thankful too. But I mean, all of us are. This is this is why we do this thing and it makes us feel great. And I have some more things to talk about when we get to it in the next episode. But uh, it does have to do with our patrons and you guys are great and just... I don't know. I feel warm and fuzzy whenever we get to this part of the episode. So thanks. Me too. Thanks again, Sayaf. Cool. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.